In today's show, our Wellington correspondent, Jordan Jakes, shares the story of iconic New Zealand mountain bike race, the Karapoti Classic. We chat with acclaimed Kiwi couture designer, Cecilia Kang, on how fashion helped her find her identity as a trans woman. We get another great tip on how to get a mortgage from the smarter mortgage lady, Rachel Thompson. We hear from master landscaper Daryl Smith from Landsmiths on how to add value to your home. I'm back with a new tasty Kiwi-made protein product that's helping me beat the bulge and feel good. And finally, housewife of Auckland and animal welfare advocate Anne Batley Burton is back to tell you why de-sexing your pussy is important. Created over 35 years ago, the Karapoti Classic is New Zealand's original and toughest mountain bike race. Let's find out about the history behind this Kiwi Classic. I put an ad in the national magazine, full page ad, saying uh, I was organising the National Mountain Bike Champs, uh, although back then it was called the New Zealand Off-Road Championships. And I had no authority to call it the New Zealand Champs, but nobody else was in charge of mountain biking because it wasn't a thing. Uh, we had 45 people from around the country come, and then it grew every year by about 20%, just because it was such a quintessential expression of, of a mountain bike adventure. After about five years, we pay for TV to come and show it, and all of a sudden it grew to a thousand people. Through native bush and rugged terrain. Starting at the Akatharawa River, the first major And the reason it's so popular is because it is quite a challenge to do. It's also really enjoyable. Um, so it's hard and rewarding as well. Two hours and 33 minutes after crossing the Akadakawa River. So everyone who finishes it has a great sense of um, personal achievement and relief that it's over and they have stories about the hill climbs and the, and the downhills and the mud and the rocks and the punctures and all the dramas. They all have stories. The first two winners of the Karapoti in 1986 rode the course with backpacks and bike carriers. The equipment may have changed, but the spirit of those days remained. For the first five years, we organised the event and made no money. Whatever money came in was spent on paying for services and bits and pieces. Um, so it was totally a labour of love. Um, it was a non-profit experience. After we'd been doing it about 15 years, it became less interesting for us, which is why after 17 years we sold it to Michael, who revived it, and we're really happy that that, happen, that happened. In the world, it's got the two sides. It's, it's the race that everybody wants to win in terms of the elite riders, but for the average person, it's, it's the race that every mountain biker wants to sort of mark off at least once. Yeah, I'm Michael Jakes. Been organising the Karapoti Classic since 2002. So I've been organising it for 18 odd years. Um, been organising events all my life really, just always been a, a keen runner and mountain biker and cyclist and triathlete and things like that. And yeah, eventually you get into organising these things, or some people do. Kick things off tonight with New Zealand's biggest mountain bike race, which is celebrating its 21st birthday. Yeah, you've got to change with the times. Um, when the internet era came in in the sort of late 90s, etc., you know, Karapoti was one of the first events to have a website. We were literally the first event in the country to have online entry. You know, one of the first events to take up electronic timing, where, where you, you know, the event's timed via electronic chips. Yeah, and we just have to keep moving with those times and keep up because you know, that's the only way you'll keep 
a new generation of people, of riders, coming into the sport. Yeah, I've been cramping a bit. Yeah, well, what can I say? Mountain biking, it's an inherently challenging sport full stop. I mean, the, the challenges for the participants are huge. You know, Karapoti is a really tough event, but you know, for organisers as well, it's pretty hard to keep an event like this going for, you know, what, 35 years now, three and a half decades. Other years we've had, uh, oh, 2012, in fact, we had a flood that nearly cancelled the race, and we postponed it and came back two weeks later and, and ran it again. Um, you know, the race has got oh, four or five quite big river crossings that people have to wade across with their shoulders held on their bikes and stuff, and so it was just too dangerous that year to run the event, just an unseasonal flood. When we took it over in 2002, the event was costing about $25,000 a year to organise. Um, last year for the 35th anniversary event, it cost about $75,000. So, you know, in less than 20 years, you know, the costs have gone up 200%. Um, but unfortunately in that time, you know, the, what people are willing to pay to, to do an event and what sponsors are willing to pay to get exposure out of the event hasn't really changed that much. And so, you know, we have to find new income streams and keep people coming into the event and you know, those are the sorts of challenges every year. You know, Karapoti, it's almost like a bit of Kiwiana, you know, it's, a, it's New Zealand's longest running mountain bike event, that says something, you know, it has a place in history in that sport and they can go out and challenge themselves to, to take on something that they didn't think perhaps that they could have done before. That's the place that things like Karapoti have in society is that you know, they give people a platform to take on new experiences and that's, that's why the Karapoti Classic will always be there. Hi, I'm Rachel Thompson, the Smarter Mortgage Lady. I'm a financial advisor and one of the things I love is getting people into their own place to call home. When people come to discuss their mortgage options with me, here are the questions I need answered to be able to provide accurate advice. What is the purchase price of the property that you're interested in? How much deposit do you have and where is it coming from? Is it from KiwiSaver or your savings? Do you have any equity in existing properties? How much do you need to borrow? And finally, what is your income? Is it from salary or self-employment? Once I have those numbers, I can give you the tools and information to do the calculations and approve yourself, because I love showing people what is possible and you may be surprised at the result. I know that once you understand how to do the calculations, you might even set new goals for yourself and achieve more than you thought possible. A smarter mortgage is one that gives you flexibility and surety, and I've personally helped a large number of people create financial certainty in their lives. To kickstart your journey, download my resource tool so you can start getting an idea of where your numbers are at, then let's talk. Click the button below and get ready to turn your mortgage into a smarter mortgage. Cecilia Kang is one of New Zealand's leading designers of couture wear and has been featured in magazines around the world. We recently sat with her to find out more about how fashion helped her find her identity as a trans woman in the world. I grew up in Auckland, New Zealand, and I came to New Zealand when I was 10 years old. So I migrated to New Zealand when I was quite young, you know, when I was a primary school student. <laughs> um, I think the main purpose was to come to New Zealand to learn English. It was actually quite an important subject over in South Korea. And then I discovered New Zealand, one of the beautiful, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I was a boy and I had to kind of discover um, my identity through the years. And I think I was actually quite feminine when I was, you know, 
when I was a boy, when I was a kid, and um, it was a kind of hard for me to discover who I am, you know, going through a lot of things in my childhood days and at school and yeah, it was, it was really hard, you know, as, as a um, trans woman. I kind of started everything when people were kind of telling me off, like, why do you walk like this? Why do you act like this? And, you know, um, all those kind of, you know, unusual things. And I think I was actually quite sensitive with my identity. So I always thought, am I, you know, is, it, is there something wrong with me? You know, um, so all the comments and, you know, so everything what people have told me throughout the years, I just, it kind of left me quite hurting, you know, it's quite a hurtful comments. But then I start to kind of realize that I'm quite different. Yeah, so that's when I went through all this phase in life to discover my identity as a trans woman and to experience a lot of new things. And during my transition, I discovered fashion was actually my thing, yeah. As a trans woman, I had I actually went out and hang out with a lot of you know LGBT community people, and I actually um, came across a lot of different drag shows and um, the flamboyant lifestyle of the LGBT community during the weekends. And, and when I actually saw some of the drag shows, that's when I realised I actually want to make some fabulous girl movies. <laughs> it just it just brought my attention and I actually that's when I actually thought oh my god I need to start making dresses <sighs> and it was just I think I kind of had my own imaginations and you know a way of thinking to you know trying to bring everything together so that's when I started to um, put everything together with all the you know sewing and pattern and you know all these design skills that I had to kind of self-taught myself during the years <laughs> yeah I always wanted to create everything by myself from scratch and you know from drawing patterning and designing and sewing and i think the whole process kind of gave me hope and love that what i wanted to do and when you see a finished garment i kind of had like big accomplishment about how i you know um, made certain garments by myself i think that's why um i loved you know getting into couture yeah, about probably like just I love the details of, you know, the couture, you know, the couture of fashion and it's just the colours and different sorts of things that drew into couture, yeah, drew me into couture. But yeah, I've fe been featured in British Vogue, Vogue Italia, um, Herald Viva, Black Magazine. There's just so, so many um, editorial that's been featured in the news article that's been shown. But, but I'm just so grateful for all the support and love from you guys, from Monique and Pete as well. <laughs> My brand is all about being different and being who you are and focuses on experimental and being artistic yeah and so it is about something i kind of have like motive that i need to bring something different each season this like from patterning and designing it needs to be different from all the collections that i've shown previously as well and i think it highly puts in the aspect of experimental that makes me want to try different things to show different level of fashion. Yeah.
G'day and welcome to my outdoor space. I live in this garden, Kiwis like to live in their garden, so we're going to talk today about the three things that you can best do to increase the value of your home. Tip number one, level up your backyard. Look at your section, it's typically on a slope. You can level it up, it doesn't necessarily have to cost that much. We call it a cut and tuck. Take a bit from here, put it over here, little baby retaining wall, you've now got a level playing field. Best way to increase the usability of your backyard. Tip number two would have to be creating some privacy. Create your little space, you know? Look over the fence, if you don't like the look, put up a great big hedge. If you want some shade, put up a specimen tree. Cut it all out, make it how you want it, create some space, create some privacy. You can do what you want, no one's gonna know. You just created a bit of value for your garden. Tip number three is to create some street appeal. Stand back on the other side of the road, look at your house, pick up the lines, pick up the slope of the land or your weatherboard lines, create a hedge line, create a fence line, create some street appeal. You can do it with planting, you drive in, you created some tropical, subtropical gardens, some specific planting, you just created some more value, really simply. It sounds really easy to put all this together. It's not actually. You need a lot of experience. I've got that. I've got the knowledge. I'd love to come and see you. I can help you put it all together. G'day and welcome to today's Guide to Better Wellness segment. If you've struggled over the years with weight management like I have, and if you want to know more, you can check out articles I've written on the Guide to Better Living website. If you perhaps know that you need to add more protein into your diet, but you're tired of eating extra chicken breasts, or you can't eat enough eggs to keep up to date with the amount of protein you need, or if you find yourself snacking in between meals on the wrong sorts of things, and you know what I'm talking about. Or finally, if you're a midlife woman like me and you notice that your waist and your hips are upsizing themselves, you need to know about this product. I'm super excited to share it with you. This is the amazing Black Current Blast. It's a protein punch drink from the team here at Protein Punch, made here in New Zealand. The great thing for you, good source of vitamin C, loaded with antioxidants, low in sugar, and every drink gives you 20 grams of protein. So if you're looking for an excuse to eat something or drink something that tastes a bit treaty, but you wanna do something to support your well-being as well, this product is a great place to start. So before I show you how easy it is to make protein punch, let's take a look at some of the product details so you can find out if it's the right product for you. This is the amazing black currant blast drink from the incredible team made here in New Zealand, Protein Punch. You're going to love it. Who is this product for? If you are super busy like me, if you're tired of eating meat, if you're tired of plant-based proteins or shakes, and if you're interested in weight management, this product is for you. Get this, 20 grams of protein per scoop, 1.3 grams of sugar, so low in sugars, low in carbs, and it's only 102 calories per drink. Key ingredients there, you've got some whey protein, so you're getting good quality protein. There's no nasty sugars in there. We're using stevia and erythritol. And then finally, it comes in two product sizes. A small bag will give you three protein drinks and a large will deliver 14. You can order online at the guide to better living.tv shop. So let's take a look at how easy it is to make protein punch. I've got a glass drink bottle here and I've got around 430 mils of cold water in here. Now inside your big bag of protein punch, you also get this handy dandy measuring scoop. I'll make sure I've got it in the right place so you can see it. So this comes, comes inside your bag. The other thing I'd recommend is if you're using a drink bottle that has a neck like this, pop a funnel on the top, super easy. Grab your protein punch, I'm just going for one scoop right up to the top and then I'm literally just going to pop that inside my scoop like that a little bit of spillage but it's all right I'm a grown-up I'm in my own kitchen I can make a mess if I want <laughs> All right, so you can see, oh, the smell of the black currants is absolutely delicious in there. 
Now that, that certainly didn't take a degree to do that, nice and easy. Now I'm gonna pop that lid on, give it a bit of a shake. And look at that, there's my protein punch. I can't stand a messy kitchen, by the way. Um, there's my protein punch, and that's already made. Now, if you find that drink, and those bubbles will start to settle shortly, if you find that drink is a little bit too sweet, the great thing, and this is what I do, because after years of being a low-carb or keto practitioner, I my tolerance for, for sweeter things, and remember it's sweetened with erythritol and a little bit of stevia in there, I find I can't have as much sugary flavours in there at all. I think we are tanked right up to the top. Pop that lid on, give it one more shake just to make sure it's all mixed together. Oh, look at that. Looks great. That is my protein punch. What I know is that with that one serving, 20 grams of protein I'm adding to my daily diet. How does it taste? Because I always have to taste everything. That is so good. So if you grew up with those delicious blackcurrant drinks when you were a child, we all know they were loaded with sugars. This is a great low-carb, low-sugar alternative with 20 grams of protein. Now, if you are considering changing your diet or maybe embracing a low-carb or keto lifestyle, it is worth talking to your health professional before you do that. The one thing I can say from my experience is that since the beginning of this year, I've reduced my sugars, reduced my carbs, and increased my protein content, and it's actually helped me shift six kilos in weight. So do talk to your health professional, get some advice, and consider how Protein Punch could support you and your well-being. Now, before I finish up today, I want to share with you something really sneaky that I've done. Uh, just recently, I wondered if I could actually turn Protein Punch into a tasty treat dessert, and by Jingo's by Hokey, I managed to do it. I got some boiling hot water, I got some gelatin, and a scoop of Protein Punch into a container, mixed it all around, poured it into a couple of shot glasses, and check this out, I was able to make four delicious desserts. I love the layering in the dessert as well. And this is a little treat that I've actually had before bedtime. Why I like it is that because I was able to make four from one drink, I've got four protein treats there, each with about five grams of protein. A really good way to support your sugar levels as you sleep. But the most important thing is how does it taste? First of all, the separation is because of the whey in there, but you've also got all those granules of blackcurrant in the bottom, so it's like a layered dessert. Here we go, I just made this a couple of hours ago and popped it in the fridge. Jelly, like a jelly tip. Oh, mm. so good and so satisfying. So when you head to guide to better living TV forward slash shop and order yours, make sure you send us a message and I'll send you back the recipe for this delicious treat. Mm, mm. So before we finish up, it's so good. Let's take a quick look at the product specs so you can decide if Protein Punch could be a good addition to your daily diet. Here we have it, Protein Punch. It's Blackcurrant Blast. If you love those tasty blackcurrant drinks of your childhood, this is a great way to have all of that yumminess without the sugar and without the carbs. Who is this product for? Everyone, if you're a low carb or if you're a keto lifestyle or anyone who wants to add more antioxidants to their diet, this is for you. The nutritional information, check it out. 20 grams of protein per drink, 1.3 grams of sugar, Check out the low carbs and only 102 calories. This is a great afternoon snack. Key ingredients, whey protein, some lovely plant sweeteners, freeze-dried organic black currants, and natural preservatives. The product comes in two sizes. You can get three drinks from a small bag or 14 drinks per large bag. Well, there you have it, Protein Punch. I have been drinking this every day, particularly around three o'clock in the afternoon when I'm tempted to get a treat out of the pantry. This is the only treat I need. It's got the sweetness of black currants and plant sugars. You've got all the greatness that protein brings by adding goodness back into your body. You've got the antioxidants from black currants and even better, it tastes magnificent. So what are you waiting for? Head to guidetobetterliving.tv forward slash shop and order yours now. Better wellness. Mm. Mm -mm.
Here at Guide to Better Living, we are proud to support a number of New Zealand charities. And each week we like to share a tip or trick from that charity to help other people live better lives. This week, we are super excited to share a tip from the amazing Champagne Lady, also known as the heart and soul and founder of the New Zealand Cat Foundation, Anne Batley Burton. This week, Anne shares a tip on why de-sexing your pussy is important. Monique, hi, here we are again. I've got a glass of champagne, I hope you have. <laughs> what I'd like to talk about today is the importance of de-sexing. Sadly, in New Zealand and in many other countries, so many people have not taken responsibility for their cats. And because of that, there's a huge proliferation of unwanted cats and kittens in our community. This is not only bad for the cats themselves, because of course they're out there trying to fend for themselves. You know about that, don't you, guys? Uh, <laughs> it's not only terrible for the cats themselves, but it's also become an issue for a lot of people in the community. Nobody wants to see a whole lot of little kittens running around, with nobody to care for them, cats and so on. And with all the conservation issues that we have in New Zealand, the concern over native birds and so on, there's a lot of people who are not happy with these cats running around. But you can't blame the cats for that. It's the irresponsibility of people that is causing this issue. So if there's one thing you need to do for your cats is to get them de-sexed. Now, there have been a, there's been a huge amount of work done by the SPCA and by rescue organisations such as my charity, the New Zealand Cat Foundation, and there's lots of other rescue organisations out there like the Community Cat Coalition, of which we are a member. These volunteers have been going out night after night on the streets, trapping and de-sexing and microchipping, vaccinating, etc., cats and kittens and trying to rehome them. But during COVID, it's become an even more serious issue because there's a huge shortage of vets because of all the lockdowns. De-sexing has not been considered important enough because of course there's animals there with serious injuries and health issues that have taken precedence. With a result that a lot of the rescue organisations haven't been able to get vet time to get cats de-sexed. This is going to cause a proliferation of cats in the community and as I say it's not the cat's problem. So please, if you've got a cat, do your best, get it de-sexed, terribly important. And if you'd like to help our work, please visit the nzcatfoundation.org.nz and click donate.